thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so I am from Laboratory of Photovoltaics and Optoelectronics here at the faculty, and I will present our activities on uh, photonic integrated circuit component design. Uh, since Professor Van Turut made a very nice introduction into the field this morning, I will try to make my introduction quite brief. Uh, so, um, the purpose of photonic integration is to, to join a high number of components on a single chip to uh, achieve high performing systems. And since the field of integrated photonics is uh, spread out between uh, uh, vari various materials and uh, fabrication technologies as well as applications, there is still quite a high demand for uh, low level component design. Uh, especially if we compare it to, uh, for instance, uh, the field of microelectronics, which is much more mature. Uh, so uh, today I will uh, present uh, our activities on design on, of mainly passive uh, integrated uh, photonic components. Uh, so the first step in the design are uh, simulations. Uh, they're a crucial step. Uh, to um, designing components and uh, circuits. Uh, so um, when uh, designing components, uh, often rigorous simulation methods such as uh, finite element method or finite difference time domain method uh, are required to define the initial geometry of a certain component to achieve the desired operation. Uh, so, um, uh, when we then connect these components into, into circuits, uh, we need to perform higher level simulations, circuit level simulations. Uh, and then additionally, uh, sometimes we also, in conjunction with these methods, we perform some optimization algorithms to really find the best performance of a certain component. Once we have the basic design, we then define the layout uh, for the mask. Uh, and we do this with uh, dedicated uh, tools such as IPKIS and KLayout. Uh, once we have our design, uh, we then uh, submit the mask for fabrication. Uh, we do that in two ways. Uh, in conjunction with the laboratory of microelectronics, uh, we are trying to develop a fabrication process for uh, silicon nitride uh, photonic chips. Uh, but we also rely on external fabrication uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, other academic partners or uh, sometimes we also submit our designs to uh, commercial foundries for rapid prototyping. Um, so once our chips are fabricated, we need to uh, experimentally characterize them. Uh, so um, the basic passive uh, measurement configuration scheme uh, consists of a tunable laser source, then a, a stage for uh, optical contacting of the photonic chip, and then a power meter to measure the output power. So this way we can get the transmission spectrum of uh, our devices. Um, for uh, optical coupling, we need to couple light from optical fiber into the uh, chip and then back. Uh, two basic schemes can be uh, employed. Vertical coupling with uh, diffraction gratings, so we can approach the chip uh, vertically, or uh, edge coupling uh, from the side to the edge of the chip. Uh, so here on top right side of the slide, uh, we show the um, effect of misalignment of optical fiber. Uh, so we can see that just by um, misalignment of a few micrometers, uh, the transmission uh, of the couplers decrease by several dBs. Uh, so this means that we uh, need very precise uh, alignment of optical fibers uh, to achieve the, the accurate and repeatab repeatable measurement results. Uh, so uh, this is the, our first measurement setup that uh, Professor Kurtz, uh, Kurtz already presented at uh, last year's uh, conference. Uh, so um, this setup allows us for vertical as well as edge coupling uh, of uh, photonic chips uh, and it consists of manually adjusted uh, stages for fiber positioning and chip positioning. Uh, we can uh, position the fibers very accurately this way and we can achieve good measurement results. Uh, however, the process of alignment is quite meticulous and uh, intense for the user. Uh, in, it, it is also sometimes difficult to achieve uh, good repeatability of measurement results. 
so um, uh, recently we invested in a new uh, um, setup for experimental uh, characterization of passive as well as active uh, photonic integrated circuits. Um, it uh, consists of uh, measurement instruments, a tunable laser source, a power four channel power meter, and um, uh, optical spectrum analyzer. And um, the uh, main part, the, the stage for optical contacting. Um, so um, this uh, probe station is automatic uh, and it uh, utilizes long travel piezo stages for uh, automatic positioning of optical fiber array to contact the chip. And it also has a, a temperature control of the chip, which is very important to, to, to be able to achieve uh, repeatable and accurate results. Um, so, um, yes, the, the setup enables automatic testing of uh, fabricated chips. If we design the mask for the chip in a smart way so that each structure can be uh, mapped, uh, so the position of the structure can be mapped uh, on the mask of the chip, we can then automatically measure all the structures on the chip overnight. We can just leave the system running and then, um, then analyze the results in the morning. Um, since uh, the uh, Everything is automatic. We can uh, ensure high reliability and accuracy of measurement results. And uh, it also enables us the option to test uh, active devices, which we intend to uh, also focus on in the future. So now moving on to some actual uh, components that we designed. Uh, for instance, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Van Turut already uh, introduced the, this morning, the uh, Quantera project for microtransfer printing for quantum uh, applications. Uh, we are also uh, part of this project. Uh, so the goal is to design a versatile quantum photonic integrated circuit uh, platform through microtransfer printing to combine different technologies on a single chip. And our role in this project is to design uh, highly efficient uh, components for light coupling uh, so since we are dealing with single photons here, it is crucial that uh, the losses are very low. So for instance, we are designing grating couplers for fiber connection, as well as some other um, uh, um, passive components, such as multi-mode uh, power splitters. Uh, but yeah, my uh, colleague Miloš Libotina will, will uh, talk more about that in the next presentation. Um, and I, I want to show here another example of a component that we designed. Uh, so a uh, polarization beam splitter in silicon photonics. Um, so uh, our main motivation here is that um, in general, silicon photonic components, uh, waveguides and other components are uh, strongly polarization dependent. So if we look at the um, waveguide cross section, it is uh, capable of carrying two polarization modes, the TE polarized mode and TM polarized mode. And uh, these modes are quite different from each other, as we can see already also here from the field uh, cross section. And they also, these two modes will accumul accumulate a different phase at a certain distance. Therefore, uh, we need to somehow manage this uh, polarization dependency. And we do that with uh, polarization management components. Uh, so most uh, the silicon photonic integrated circuit application requires some way of uh, polarization splitting using polarization beam splitters, uh, which are capable of splitting the mixed polarization at the input into two uh, polarization modes at two outputs, so that we get TE mode at one output and TM mode at the other output. Uh, and in order to design our component, we um, utilized uh, so-called dielectric metamaterials uh, they consist of two or more periodically exchanging materials uh, where they have a spatial period well below the wavelength of light. And this way we can achieve anisotropy in refractive index, uh, which can then be used to manipulate with light propagation. And such, uh, such structures can be uh, fabricated by standard fabrication processes, such as, for instance, CMOS. Um, so here on the top of this slide, uh, we show the basic structure of our component. Uh, so we have at the input the mixed polarization, so both modes are present there. 
And then uh, this structure will split this two polarization into two outputs, one for TE output on top and the other for TM output on the bottom. So this uh, first section, uh, the two waveguides are in proximity to each other, and that means that light can couple from the first excited waveguide to the adjacent waveguide. But we uh, introduce this metamaterial structure in between those two waveguide cores, which will then suppress the coupling of TE mode. Uh, this means that the TE mode will remain in the first waveguide. Uh, and then if we um, uh, so define the length of this coupling structure in a proper manner, we can achieve that all the TM mode will couple to the cross port and we have those two polarization modes separated. Uh, and additionally, we also employ the TE polarizer uh, at the through output of the device to get rid of uh, some excess TM polarization to improve the extinction ratio of the device. Uh, you can also notice that the coupling structure has two bands. Uh, we uh, utilize this band to uh, change the phase of light propagating through the coupler in order to, to achieve a broadband op operation of the, of the component. Uh, so we fabricated this, uh, this uh, device uh, on a silicon and insulator wafer uh, using a commercial uh, foundry, Applied Nanotools, from Canada. Um, so they, uh, they employ electron beam lithography for rapid prototyping of uh, photonic integrated circuits. So on the le left side of the slide, uh, I show the scanning electron microscope image of the fabricated device. And the chip was then measured using our manual experimental setup. And we found out that the extinction ratio of our device is above 30 dB in a bandwidth of at least 140 nanometers with the insertion loss below 2 dB. And then after literature research, we found that uh, this uh, performance is uh, basically uh, on par with the best performing polarization beam splitters in the literature, especially in terms of uh, wide bandwidth and high extinction ratio. So I want to conclude my talk with the outlook for the future research that we want to do in our group. Um, the new equipment, as I already mentioned, allows for a fast testing of a high number of passive structures as well as active structures. So we intend to uh, extend our research activities on photonic integrated circuits in general, and maybe uh, sometime in the future focus also on active components. With that, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Andras. Uh, it's not time for a question. Yes, please, at the back. You said that the um, resolution of the of the metamaterial needs to be way smaller than wavelength. Can you maybe comment on that? And would this work well with um, non-e-beam kind of processes? And what kind of process would it need to be? Yes, thank you for your question. Well, um, so as some of you might know, e-beam process can go down to around 50 nanometers, which is quite a small feature size for, for wafer scale photolithography. Um, but since we are working with uh, 1550 nanometer wavelength, we can go a bit higher with uh, the minimal feature size. Um, so as far as I know, so with extreme UV lithography, we can already go down to around 100 nanometers for a minimal feature size. And yeah, in our case, we also designed one structure with a minimal feature size of 100 nanometers. So it was fabricated using e-beam lithography, but in the future, maybe also with some further development of the technology, it can also be uh, potentially fabricated using wafer scale lithography. Okay, any other question? Please, please. Maybe I already asked before, but um, the bandwidth uh, of the device is, is impressive, also the crosstalk. But the losses could, certainly for quantum-like uh, applications, uh, losses would preferably still be lower. Do you see yeah, a route to get lower losses? Um, 
Yes, it, it, it does come a, a little bit as a trade-off between bandwidth and the losses. So we can actually, with a simpler structure, we can achieve very low, uh, much lower uh, losses, but uh, in a, a, a quite a narrower bandwidth. Uh, but also, yes. I, I maybe didn't point, out, point this out in this, uh, in this presentation, this insertion losses below 2 to D, I think are a, a, a bit of a conservative assessment because in these measurements we did not uh, uh, measure uh, certain uh, like cascaded structures to really accurately assess the losses. Uh, so yes, this was a conservative assessment and it's also a plan for the future to assess the losses better and we expect that maybe they could be for like a, at least half a dB better. What are they in the simulation? Uh, in simulation, they are below 1 dB. Okay. Yeah. Maybe last question. Well, it's maybe a comment. I think that for QKD or something like that, the bandwidth would, should be in the order of nanometers anyway, because you have problems elsewhere if you have a more broadband laser. So I think that trade-off would be very well appreciated. So smaller bandwidth and less insertion loss.